Good evening everyone, time for another Bitcoin report. This is going to be the last of the series cryptographic disruption. You can see here the Bitcoin chart, we're forming up that final pennant, in my opinion, before we move to that 1000 mark. That's going to be a very, very key move because if we get to 1000, then this bull is still alive and that is going to mean a lot of things a lot more people flooding back into Bitcoin so let's get back in and finish up we're looking at Cicada 3301 we're looking at NSA spying we're looking at the technology behind this just to summarize real quick we're talking about end devices, specifically computers, desktops, laptops, cellular phones, that Jacob Applebaum is telling us are compromised. We have Dell apologizing now for having a back door and many, many others who have admitted to or are alleged to have back doors, Cisco, Dell, Western Digital, Juniper was mentioned, Seagate, Maxstore, Samsung. So we're talking about back doors into these devices. Why are we talking about back doors into these devices? We're going to summarize this and explain it to you at the end of why we're talking about back doors into the devices because the tunnel is encrypted. It's unbreakable. It's disruptive to the police state. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. And we're seeing a war that's starting now and we're apparently seeing recruitment for this war so let's get back to the Cicada 3301 story fascinating story if you remember last time we were covering Cicada 3301 2013 and the tests that were run now we had reached a series of onion addresses if you remember onion is dot onion are tor addresses that's the dark net the dark web that's the onion router that no one knows who's going in and coming out this is where silk road was located and uh, there's a lot of speculation about tor and all of this i'm not even going to get into that but clearly they're using these onion addresses to have the participants go and get their next clue. So we had three onion addresses so far and we're on to this fourth and final onion address. Now if you remember they said to stand by for coordinates they were going to give coordinates again as they did in the first test. They had cicadas posted on telephone poles at certain coordinates with QR codes. This time it is cicadas posted on lampposts at specific geographic coordinates around the world with telephone numbers. And these were the numbers and the locations. Once five of the ten SSSS codes had been retrieved, they could be decrypted to form their message, which was P7AM, etc. Dot onion. This was the fifth onion. So we've got five onion addresses now. This is going to be the final onion address. This is where our participants, now you have to remember that I pointed out before they're narrowing it down to get to these stages here. Clearly this stage requires a group. Now it's possible for one person maybe to call somebody and try to find somebody who lives there to go down to that address. Is somebody going to rip down the poster? I don't know. I mean, it, it. none of this is live for very long. So this is just up long enough for the groups that are right on the cutting edge to get the information. You can only do it through a group, and uh, then the information isn't going to be valid. And this last onion address is going to take you to the last message, and this is what they get. They were greeted with this message PGP sign message welcome and congratulations we've been pleased with your teamwork while teamwork is most important we must also test you individually for this reason in recognition of the fact that 
each individual contributes differently and I'm missing some of this here so I'll try to get this it's edged off we'll go ahead and just put this one in a notepad again I apologize about that uh, the host of this should probably change the formatting on this so let's get this in a notepad so we can see the whole thing here in recognition of the fact that each individual contributes differently and there is no right way to contribute we're gonna see that there's no right way when we get to the moral or theological questions this test has no right or wrong answers it is designed to show us how you think and how resourceful you are that's very common if you go to job interviews today especially in technology companies uh, they they ask technical questions and a lot of them do have a right answer but it's an answer you need to arrive at it's just like they tell you in math class not so interested in the answer or they're partially interested in the answer they're also interested at how you arrive at the answer each question is timed and any answer provided after the time has expired will not be accepted you're free to research the questions but keep the time limit in mind asking fellow participants or friends for help or their answers is not allowed do not publish these questions at this time we ask you to create a new email address to be used for communication for the rest of this challenge it should be new not associated with your identity creating a web mess uh, web based email provider should not include any identifying words you'll also need to create a GPG key for use with this address and upload it to the key servers once you have completed the above enter the email address below to receive your ID number keep this ID number as you will use it to begin the test each person may only register once good luck cicada signature so what happened here is the individuals were broken down now on the basis of the test so we'll go to part two and again this is broken down between part one and part two because what part one is what is publicly available part two is what we have reported by multiple sources so apparently this is verified in the sense that we have multiple sources reporting it but we can't be certain because it wasn't publicly available upon entering their emails into the website the solvers were given a set of test questions and requested not to publish them there are 19 questions in total with three different types the first type of question gave a statement and then a multitude of answers which were now if you remember the warning that we had talking about the type of existential Sartrean Nietzschean uh, type of worldview philosophy even Crowleyan uh, this very much is in line with that these questions are attempts to decide if you are someone who agrees or disagrees with that type of worldview obviously I would be a person who would fail this test uh, dramatically because I probably answer everything true in uh, true or false or indeterminate but you can see here that there are answers to these true false questions and there are multiple ones there is true there is false indeterminate meaningless self-referential game rule strange loop and none of the above now here are the questions there is no truth is that true is that false etc what you are is more important than what you do you cannot step into the same river twice observation changes the thing being observed this sentence is false I am the voice inside my head you undoubtedly just thought I don't have a voice inside my head that is the voice question is referring to disregard color blindness any arbitrary color looks the same to all people if a is not true then it must be 1 equals 0.9 recurring 9999 etc people who only study material after a test do better than those who do not study at all grass is only green due to a relationship between the grass the lights and your mind all things are true we get hundreds of millions of sensations coming into our minds at any moment our brain cannot process them all 
So it categorizes these signals according to our belief systems. That is why we find evidence to support our beliefs and rarely notice evidence to the contrary. The second type of question included an input box with the question, these questions were, what does the word it refer to in this sentence? It is dark outside, question mark. The mathematical operation known as addition is modeled after what? Explain in your own words what mathematical operation is relied upon for the security of Shamir's secret sharing scheme. Name similarities between the concept and reality of the news feed on Facebook. In the programming language of your choice, write a function that returns the value 3301. The final type of question only appeared once and it had a different it had different radio buttons to the first type. This question was, two people are standing by a lake. One says, that's a lovely reflection in the water. The other says, I see no reflection, but it's a fascinating assortment of fish, plants, and rocks within the water. Which one is lying? The answer to this question, answers to the question were, the one who sees the reflection, the one who sees the fish, neither, both. It has been noted that the abstractness of these questions is very similar to the questions that Google supposedly asks its interviewees for serious roles at the company that can supposedly be used to determine a person's personality and type. Each question in the test is timed to prevent one from externally researching the questions, and the questions chosen were in random order from the above pool. This page also saved two cookies on the user's computer, which were 167 and 761. Note that 167 and 761 are EMERPS primes, which appeared earlier in the puzzle set, the Instar Emergence song, etc. An EMERP prime spelled backwards is a prime number that results in a different prime when its digits are reversed. A palindromic prime, sometimes called a pal prime, is a prime number. There's also a palindromic number. That's one that reads forward and backwards the same. A palindromic number or numerical palindrome is a number that remains the same when its digits are reversed, etc. <clears throat> After completing the test, each solver was sent to the following, the following email to the address they had inputted. Please note that the GPG signature has been removed, but multiple sources have confirmed that they received this email. This is the last test. This is actually a programming test. You can see that the person is required to perform. In the programming language of your choice, build a TCP server that implements the protocol below. The server code must be written by you and you alone, although you are free to use any modules or libraries publicly available for the selected programming language. Once you've done this, make it accessible as a Tor hidden service. Then provide us with the onion address and port via GPG encrypted email to this address. You have until 0.00, .00 UTC on the 3rd of February 2013. Any emails received after that time will be ignored. Good luck, 3301. So you can see here two very important things that the person is required to be able to do. They're required to be able to write the code for this type of TCP server, very similar to the things they've been going through. Requires an understanding of the coding language, requires an understanding of TCP IP, the language of the internet. We're going to go into that later. And it also requires an understanding of the Tor, the hidden network, and the, the dark web. So clearly this is a test of what they're going to be doing. Here's a description, I'm not going to go too far into it, but uh, the TCP server must listen on an arbitrary port and send and receive plain text with the line separated by a control F representing a carriage return followed by a line feed. The TCP server must disregard the case of input. The examples below, line set by the server will be preceded with S, etc., etc. Uh, they had to program in these uh, responses with the codes. Welcome, OK, error, data, and goodbye. Upon receiving a remote connection, the server must greet the client with the 00 welcome message, etc. Then there's the RAND response, the Quine uh, base 29 code, COEN, 
DH, next, and the goodbye. So you can see a pretty complex requirement here to build this TCP server. Now, they didn't say what language it had to be built in. And you can see here that the solvers began to work on their TCP server programs and submitted them by the deadline presented in the email. Clearly, we're broken down to an individual here. I guess you could have two people working on it together, or maybe three as the one, but probably not. So they're probably all individual coders. Only the coder is going to be the one that they're looking for. Also having an intricate understanding of TCP IP, the internet, the Tor network, dark web, and all of these philosophical principles. So they're looking for genius level people here with the same moral outlook. An example server coded in Go is located here. Example server coded in Python is here. There was no response until two weeks later when finally the TCP servers were pinged. A log on one of the servers testing is listed below and you can see here's the requests that came in RAND 3301 COIN these are the requests that came in and then the goodbye. There were reports that stated they received a message similar to the leaked email from 2012's puzzle. These reports cannot be confirmed as no email was leaked. After that, everything went silent again, hopefully for only another year this time. So is it going to happen again this year? I don't know. You can see here in the messages below someone posted what was supposedly cicada but we don't know indicating that today January 4th was going to be the date uh, I'm not finding the message here but uh, so we will probably know in here it is stop looking stop searching we've stopped confirming the last year is here the last year is now you won't get us back off right now. This year our trials will be harder. Be prepared. Good luck, 3301, supposedly December 12th. We don't know if this is it or not. Uh, there's others that had talked about this war is going to start. Uh, there's uh, a lot of mentions of these weird websites that uh, there was one weird, weird website. Here's one supposedly from Cicada. To live is to die, to code is to decode, to watch is to learn, patience is a virtue. January 4th, 2014, good luck, 3301. I don't know what signature that is. So a lot of speculation. We're going to find out within the next two days whether or not there is going to be a test for Cicada 3301, 2014. So what is this all about? It's my contention that this is about a war that's going on and I don't know who it's between we probably can guess that the NSA is involved we can probably guess that anonymous is involved we can probably guess that the Chinese are involved and maybe the Russians maybe the KGB we don't know but we just know that there is a big battle going on again this video uh, you can see 532,000 views. This gentleman, Jacob Applebaum, is in Germany now, in Hamburg, and apparently he is afraid to come to the United States. He's kind of a Snowden-type character in a way. He's revealing, supposedly, I, I can't confirm or deny, their leaked, official leaked documents from the NSA, which so all types of technologies that are be that have been developed and are supposedly being used to do spying at the endpoint and that's going to be the main point we're going to try to get across to you tonight about this war and what it's about and why they're recruiting these genius hackers into this war which side they're on what they're trying to do so let's go to this whiteboard that I've been referring to for a while. This is a very, very simplified type of thing that I've drawn out here. It's really just two computers, computer A, computer B. Of course, each has its own IP address. 
of whatever dot whatever etc and they are communicating with each other we'll say over the internet now what these two are establishing is what we'll call a socket connection now you can see this here this is a sample image of netstat i didn't do one on my computer because obviously that's going to reveal more information than i want you to be able to see so here is a netstat now if you want to do that it's pretty easy go down to start click on search type in cmd bring up command prompt and type in netstat with the various switches that you can use if you want to find out what those switches are at the command prompt you can type in netstat question mark enter it's going to give you the various switches dash a dash n etc so what you're looking at here is an output of the TCP IP stack you can see protocol TCP you have a local address a foreign address and the state of this we'll call it socket connection so you can see here these established socket connections this is an established socket now what that means is you have four parts to this you have the local address and the local port you can see that's port 80 on this IP address that's a 10 dot address so that's someone's router that's the private network behind the LAN side of their router on port 80 that's the address for the World Wide Web they're connected to this IP address this is the foreign address and on that port this is going to be a random incrementing port that's how TCP works you can see a series of them down here so this is an established socket this is a connection between two computers on an IP address and a TCP port that's layers 3 and layer 4 of the OSI model which is the model that's used to understand the way the internet works so this socket is the way that a connection is established between two computers they both have an IP address they both have a port the information that's passed between these two computers on this socket connection is passed in in these packets these packets have and this is a gross oversimplification I'm just doing this for purposes of explanation for people who don't who aren't techies and don't understand this stuff so don't uh, put a bunch of criticisms about uh, the details of this so this is just very simple breakdown this is a packet the packet has a header and it has a data section two sections to this packet inside this header section is going to be the source and destination so the source will be computer A the destination will be computer B the way that TCP IP works is that it creates a, a three-way transmission it has a um, first you have a communication one way listening and then the next way and then what it does is it creates a window as it communicates back and forth across this now when we introduce encryption into this situation what happens is this data payload here is encrypted with a key that is controlled by one side and the other side this either side can only understand is the only party that can understand what's in this data payload so normal communications that you do over the internet if there's a man in the middle anywhere in here in the middle of this communication whether it's a router or a switch or anything between these two points can read everything that's contained in this packet including all the header information and all the data information obviously then a person in the middle can spy on everything that happens so for those of you involved in the ISP industry or the telcos you know that for the longest time the FBI etc have required access to be able to sniff the packets that are going across the networks whether that's telephone circuits or whatever they require a back door into that that's analogous to the back doors that we're talking about with Dell and uh, these endpoint devices so 
it's kind of surprising to me that people are shocked that the authorities are demanding a backdoor into the endpoint devices while they've known all along that they've demanded a backdoor into these uh, devices on the internet. Nevertheless, let's say that this device here is a router, a Juniper or Cisco router. If this is sent across the normal internet, then all the information in the header and the data portion of this packet is readable by anybody who's mirroring a port off of this device. So they can make a copy of all the information that's contained here and read exactly what's communicated. On the other hand, if this data portion is encrypted by the sender and only to be unencrypted by the receiver, then although they can read the source and destination of this packet, anybody in the middle cannot read the information that's contained in the packet. It becomes garbled nonsense. It becomes just a bunch of gibberish. It is encrypted. It cannot be deciphered except for the person that has the key. This is the same technology that Bitcoin is based on it's cryptography, it's the nature of random numbers and any a long series of numbers. You can see in the signatures that we have, the PGP sign signatures, a large string of letters and numbers and you can think about uh, the amount, here's an example of this signature. You can think about the amount of effort that it takes to generate this signature. Not much. I can sit here and you can see the requirements here if we look at it closely. It's got letters, lowercase, uppercase, and uh, numbers. So just offhand you can guess you can also see slashes in here. So does it have also all the characters? Yeah, there's plus signs. So do the math. You've got 26 lowercase letters, 26 uppercase letters. You've got 10 digits. You've also got however many numbers of uh, these random characters. So, and then you've got this many times. So to generate this is very simple. Uh, imagine the type of computing power it would take to break this, to randomly guess. How long would it take to randomly guess the lowercase i? not very long but then the uppercase Q you can see it's going to be a factor of whatever that is 62 to the 62nd power and multiply it by the numbers here and you're going to get a number that's so large that's so incomprehensible some have said that it's something close to the amount of computing power contained in all of the energy of the Sun to break one of these encrypted signatures so that's the idea behind this. This is a tunnel between these two places. It now becomes an unbreakable tunnel. And that means that everything in between here is irrelevant. Nothing in the middle of this tunnel can read the information as it comes across because it's garbled nonsense to everybody in the middle except for these two devices on the endpoints that have the keys. Now this is not a new thing. This is actually an old thing. You can see HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This requires in the communication security portion of the requirements, it requires encryption. So you can see down here, uh, I think I skipped it. Let's find the security portion here. So the security rule states, oh, that's not the technology. Technical safeguards, controlling access to computer systems and enabling, and enabling covered entities to protect communications via electronically transmitted open networks. If closed systems are utilized, then it's fine, but existing controls uh, but if it's going across an open network, when information flows across open networks, some form of encryption must be utilized. So 
if your medical records are transmitted from the doctor to the hospital, it cannot be transmitted across the internet unless it's transmitted within a private line and then layer 3 encryption on top of that to secure the fact that no one in the middle can sniff that information and get your private information. That's the same thing that we have going on with the banks. The banks also require for their data circuits that they be a point-to-point -point private line on layer 2 and an encrypted tunnel on layer 3 so that nobody in the middle can break in to this tunnel. So that's the basis of encryption and why it is a disruptive technology. What it is disruptive of is everyone here in the middle who wants to hear the conversation. That's why we're seeing this rollout here that is being described by Jacob Applebaum of the controversy over the NSA and their listening in and planting listening devices. If you remember back in the old days if you wanted to spy on someone say this person sitting at this computer you want to spy on them well you planted a bug in their room or you put a camera in the flower vase or you put a microphone up above so you could listen or you got a camera somehow to look at their screen to see what they're typing this disruptive technology encryption forces the spy agencies or people whether they're hackers or anyone else who want to listen to this conversation back to this endpoint they have to see what's on the screen or hear what's being entered in because once it enters into this tunnel it's going to make it across to the other side and it cannot be intercepted so that's the basis of this battle that's the disruptive technology that cryptography is that's why we're seeing this war occur and the recruitment happen and that's also the same type of disruptive technology that Bitcoin is based on and that of course is why we're seeing and now we're seeing the breakout happening again I believe tonight we'll probably see that run to a thousand and uh, hopefully that is going to be a full resumption of the Bitcoin bull market and we'll talk to you next time